your chain is doing something which is challenging, yeah, exciting, I assume, opening up a store in the United States. I know. Do you think it's a bad idea? <laughs> it's a big idea. It's a big idea. One of the things that we'd like to do is focus on, on stories of Canadian excellence. And I think TNT certainly fits the bill, but for someone who's never been in yeah. one of your supermarkets, how would you describe it to them? Uh, I, I describe it as a really amazing specialty store with great fresh produce and seafood and bakery cakes that you die for. <laughs> so what's interesting is you didn't use the word Asian at all oh, in describing the supermarket. Did I not? Supermarket. Definitely is Asian. Yeah, so I, yes, we are an Asian grocery store, or I'd also like to say a specialty store with an Asian flair. Because what I think has like, evolved over time is that we're not just an Asian grocer for Asian people, we're a specialty store that everyone enjoys to shop. So let's talk about the origin story of TNT, that first store, and the role that your mom played. Yes. Well, um, my parents, Jack and Cindy, immigrated to Canada in 1978, and I was born here. They started actually in the food wholesale business. So importing products and then selling it door to door, knocking on um, you know, small businesses in Chinatown. The uh, grocery store came into play when um, it became quite difficult for everyday shopping to happen at some volume. At the time, shopping from the butcher shop to the seafood shop to the bakery shop to the produce shop, and you're, you've got all your hands full. There's no shopping carts right there. You've got your hands full of shopping bags, and there's no shopping carts, and there's no bathrooms. And my mother was just so fed up. She was like, oh, I just wish we could have an Asian version of Safeway. If I need this, this is my mother, Cindy. If I need this, then more people need this. And um, so we went from food wholesale, which my dad continued to run, and said, Mom, you run the retail business. We found some excellent international investors to come together with the Lee family to start TNT. But it all sounds so easy when you say it in a sentence, but it's another thing to build it. Like, how, what did it take for your mom to build this, this supermarket? Uh, no, it was... Um, those early days were very difficult for her. My father had experience in food. My mother was a part-time accountant. You know, one amazing thing about my mother is that she has this really uncanny sense for what women want, what women need, what mothers want. And um, that while she lacked the retail experience, she made up for in a determination to learn and made up for like a real sensitivity to the customer. In the early days, there was times where I think the business almost, you know, only had six months of cash flow left. Like to fill a grocery store with all of those products takes a lot of cash. My mother will never forget the time she called her father and said, I can't do this. We are, we're running out of money. Um, I'm so scared. I remember this conversation because she's crying and I can hear that this is happening. So I'm sitting outside of her bedroom door, like with my ear, like sort of pressed up against the bedroom door. I've never heard her so upset. And she's talking about how difficult it is and how she's just about to throw in the towel. Her dad, my grandfather, brought her back, gave her reason, gave her confidence, and said, hey, calm down. Are there customers in the store? My mom's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it's a bit messy right now, but there's so many customers in this store. She went through all these little things, and then my, my grandfather brought her back to say, like, if the customer's there and they love what you're doing, then things are all gonna work out. 
luckily, the Asian community was really patient at the time. This is 1993, so we have a strong population of um, Taiwanese background people, Hong Kong people coming over at the time, and they wanted what my mother wanted. They were also, you know, finding it difficult to complete their full shop. Mm -hmm. So that, that, the patience from the customer, my mother's determination, and my grandfather's sort of talk of reason, that would have been her moment to say, yeah, we, we, we made it past the most difficult bis time of the business going from zero to one. What about the city of Vancouver, particularly in the 90s, this Canadian city perched on the Pacific, very much with a connection to Asia? Mm -hmm. We would not have been as successful had it not been Vancouver and Richmond and this environment that allowed us to start a business and grow this business that was a celebration of food and culture. And that is acceptable in our society. That is Vancouver. Like Vancouver is known as the gateway to Asia. You know, when you talk about the, the celebrating diversity and the place of TNT, you know, in 2024, it seems very natural and comfortable. Um, what about in the 90s and the early 2000s? W was it as easy? I think in our f the first decade to 15 years of doing business, we were very much considered an Asian store for Asian people. Mm -hmm. It was not something that crossed over into culture, uh, other cultures. And for the Asian community, it was like, well, this is my best secret. I've now got a store that, is, that, that speaks to me, mm -hmm. that is me, and that's really shifted, you know, in the 2000s and even way more so recently, you know, in 2020s, today is 2024. We recently did a survey and it tells us that 40% of our customers today are non-Chinese speaking. Wow. Like, there's no way, like when my, when my parents started the business, like that was, that, 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 that seems like such a far reach. Mm -hmm. Like maybe in the 70s, maybe in the 60s, Italian food was considered ethnic food, mm -hmm. like here in Canada. And now, like everybody eats and accepts spaghetti and pasta and, yeah. and, and meatballs. Like that's, you know, that's just as much Canadian food as what we provide. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see that transition and I can see the maturing Canadian palate to embrace all these different cultural foods. And so it turns out to be 40% of our customers are non-Chinese speaking. And that is something that gives us great pride. So the magic of TNT, obviously, uh, a lot of it has to do with family. And incidentally, you're one of the T's in TNT. Yes. Yeah. My sister's name, fun fact, is Tiffany. So mm -hmm. it's uh, Tina and Tiffany. She'd like to argue it's Tiffany and Tina. Huh. But I think most people don't know. I actually also have a brother. My brother's name is Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't make the cut. He didn't make the cut. So TNT is building, it's building across Canada, and then Loblaw, the big supermarket chain, is interested in, in acquiring TNT. Yes. What did that mean for your mom? What did that mean for the company? It was the early start of that conversation. Um, it was a real surprise to us. And we got to meet uh, Mr. Weston Sr. and Galen Weston himself, and our stories were quite similar and they showed admiration for what we were doing and we were flattered by it. So we still uh, manage the business today, we're still shareholders in the business today and they have been an incredible part of the reason why we're able to accelerate our growth and um, they have great respect. They're like, Tina, Cindy, we want you to stay, we want your management to team to stay and uh, we want to help you reach more Canadians. Now, you know some people, as they hear you speak so warmly about Law Blah, yeah. might be kind of yelling at their TV and saying, I know. We don't like Law Blah. I know. And we don't like their prices. What do you say to those people? Yeah, I honestly, it hurts. It hurts a lot. Um, I feel like Law Blah is 
the most misunderstood business. And look, I am not at, in that building that much. I operate separately, TNT, from Loblaws. But the times that I have had a chance to interact with him and um, uh, how much Loblaws has supported TNT growth, I admire that. I do feel warmly about that. Us as an industry, Loblaws happens to be the biggest, us as an industry happens to be taking it on the chin right now. There's no doubt, life is hard right now. What makes life hard? Mortgage rates are making life hard. I have 7,000 staff, and what's hurting right now? Mortgage rates, rents, gas, certainly food is a part of it. But right? some people would say predatory pricing by grocery chains. Is that true? Is and that happening? What? No, so look, there are 1,001 things that can go wrong in a grocery store, 1,001 things. My mother likes to remind me all the time, okay? And I'm sure that in this banner, on that street, it did occur at some point. I'm not saying Lobla hasn't made mistakes in the past. I have made mistakes in the past too. I just think people need to understand that that is not the intent. It is not the intent. If you look at the profit model of a grocery store, uh, there is, like, we sort of whittle down to 4% profit. If people were so mad about it and we all became charities at the end of the day, how much would you spend, save on your grocery bill? Like 4%. Is that going to move the dial? Like, you know, I'm not sure, right? But by the way, this is how I feel. And it's a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Canada is actually a very competitive grocery market. There's a lot of different choices you have. And if you don't like the pricing of that particular store, then go to vote with your feet and your wallet and go down the street into another store. I think I'm getting great credit for value for money right now in this moment. There are over 1,500 products that we've sold in the last 12 minutes, we've reduced their pricing and it's cheaper than 2022. That's our, you know, it comes down to strategy, it comes down to execution, comes down to quality and experience and all of the things that it takes to have a great grocery store experience. It cost me $15 million to build a store sometimes. I feel good when my staff can say, yeah, I feel great value for money and I'm shopping all my groceries. Uh, here, I'm not shopping around anymore, so we have covered all the different income levels, and I aspire to this for my customers too, which is whatever your income level, you can walk the entire store of TNT and you can shop with dignity. Talk about your meeting here earlier this morning. It, it was fascinating for us to watch. Okay. Um, so I'll mention a few things that, that, that I noticed, and you tell me what it says about where TNT is. Yeah, right now. sure. What did you notice? Well, first of all, it started with a staff member singing beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how many <laughs> weekly meetings start like that. Why? Why do you do that? Uh, so. Um, well, our, the meeting, it's called a huddle, it's our weekly huddle. It starts at 9 o'clock at 8.57. We used to play a song over the overhead to say, hey guys, it's time to come, the huddle's going to start soon. And a lot of us like karaoke around here. Shocking. <laughs> Are you surprised? Like, <laughs> can I stereotype that a lot of us likes the karaoke around here? And um, so we sing, and, and um, sometimes we do it off work. And then I just realized we have so many good singers in this building. Mandarin seem to be the, the main language of the presentation. I, I found that interesting as well. Yeah, we're also um, um, a really interesting place to work in that way where um, you can use the language that you're comfortable in. If you're comfortable speaking Mandarin, then speak Mandarin. Actually, you didn't hear Cantonese today, but Cantonese is also commonly heard in this building. Um, English is commonly heard in this building. And for the most part, you know, everybody understands what's going on. And like, that's rare, right? That's, that's rare at, at, at corporate. In a, in a corporate setting. It's pretty amazing to be a new immigrant to Canada and then to be able to have the chance to operate in your own language. Mm -hmm. You can really be the best that you can be when you're not trying to translate stuff that's happening in your mind. The other thing that was striking to me is the CEO of the company 
was cutting up mango and showing people her <laughs> secret on how to do that. It just felt like really informal. It, it is informal. It is informal. We do something called like new this week, like product introductions, and we'll have whatever is coming up new in each of the department. Uh, they want to share it with everyone. You know, we like to say like giving food for joy. Like this joy is not like it's not happy, but it's like a sustained kind of joyfulness. And we do that with these new products and ingredients and, and trends that are coming. Today, like the produce department was like, hey, let me tell you about this new tree ripened mango from Peru. Let me tell you about this, this uh, uh, easy to open coconut. Like that's fun. And it's like, in the end, isn't that what this is all about? If we did this interview 25 years ago, the headline would be, young woman of Asian descent is CEO of a supermarket chain. In 2024, is that still a factor? Is that still an issue for you? I don't think this role was meant for me. I think it's kind of funny that the third kid, we had another kid in our family because my dad really wanted a boy. <laughs> and it is somewhat traditional uh, in family businesses for heirs to be males, like that, you know. I can agree with you that 25 years ago, uh, that it is rare for a successor to be a daughter. In fact, what is even more rare is that this is a matriarch story. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't think of many other matriarch stories where you go mother founder to daughter successor. And by the way, we're a minority story. Like, that's pretty crazy. It never occurred to my, my parents before. Like, you know, they didn't judge whether I could do the job or not do the job uh, because I'm a female. Like, it was not a thing close, but I think it is a, a unique thing culturally and also that we are outside of Asia, that we are here in Canada. That is, that is unique. Speaking of openings, yes. your chain is doing something which is challenging, yeah. exciting, I assume, bold, risky, yeah. opening up a store in the United States. I know. Do you think it's a bad idea? <laughs> it's a big idea. It's a big idea. So Seattle, Washington. That's right. How big a risk is that? It depends on who you ask. And let me tell you the real story. Every American long weekend, our stores in Richmond, particularly at Lansdowne Mall, we see a huge inflow of new customers and new faces. And about, you could go into the parking lot and about like one in 10 cars in the parking lot have American plates. And our cashiers will tell us, they're scanning these foreign credit cards, like they're American credit cards. And so um, we know that people in Seattle are taking their long weekend and they're thinking, well, what am I going to do this weekend? Uh, I'm going to go drive up to Richmond, BC, Canada's gateway to Asia. I'm going to have great food. I'm going to have a you know, great dim sum. I'm going to go to TNT. I'm going to buy all these things that I can't find in, my, uh, uh, in, in Bellevue. I'm going to have a meal there and take it home. So there's a very natural customer need. Mm -hmm. They're driving three hours. Here's the problem though, it's a different country, different regulations, different supply chain. Completely. A lot of Canadian companies have, have dreamed of going to the United States and that dream has just run aground for them. It might for me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, like, it, it, I honestly am a bit scared. But it was kind of like my, um, my mother's moment with my grandfather. Are the customers there? And do you do something that nobody else does in that market that the customers would come and shop with you? We've done enough market research. We think we have something special. We don't plan on going across the border and going through all of that 
regulatory rigmarole for just one store. We're going to do our best to make sure that we're going to bring Canadians pride, that um, customers in Bellevue are going to love what we do, and try to mitigate all those risks to make sure we don't have empty shelves. Like That's like my nightmare. That would be my nightmare. Um, but it's a worthy journey. You want to make Canadians proud by succeeding in the United States. Let me finish with this. How does your mother feel about this pivotal moment for the company? I brought it up to my mother in like 2012, and she's like, there's totally something there, but that's your chapter. <laughs> that's on you. That's on you, girl. You go get that. Uh, but no, but I, I'll, 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 I'll be cheering you on from the sidelines. <laughs> Gosh, man. I hope we succeed, but I'm humble about it. It's a different country. It's going to be hard. You know, let it not be the next time we're together, three years from now, and we're having the same interview like, okay, Tana, let's talk about what went wrong. <laughs> you know, this is going to be a great Canadian lesson of what went wrong and how not to do business in the U.S. You know, like, let not that be, and we're going to be together again three years from now saying, wow, this is a great Canadian company that made it across the border. But it would be pretty cool if something born in Richmond, B.C. became something that we could export to other countries. I look forward to our next interview, which I understand is in three years from now. Yeah, I know. Let's do this again. All right. And let it not be like an Ivy Business School case study of how to screw it up. <laughs>